Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our program, Leading Change in a High Stakes World, a conversation with the Commandant of the Marine Corps. Please welcome Dakota Wood, Senior Research Fellow in the Heritage Foundation Center for National Defense. Uh, just to be clear, I'm not the Commandant. Yeah, we're on a beard last night so you could tell us Pepper apart. Um, I guess an administrative thing, if you've got one of these surveillance and tracking devices, you want to uh, turn those things off or at least mute right. them so it doesn't ring in the middle of this. I don't know that anybody uses it as a phone anymore. It's a gaming device and I watch YouTube videos. Thank you for being here, uh, especially for coming in person. It's a rare occasion these days for people to actually go into a building. I think we've got 400 folks or so online, so fairly well attended. And it's just really our honor uh, to have General Berger here. Uh, when I was a young captain, uh, ground guy in the Marine Corps, I was assigned to an aviation office in the Pentagon. Actually, it was at the Navy Annex building, doesn't even exist anymore. And I was amazed as a young captain that we had some older folks there who'd been around for 41, 42 years in uniform and still plugging away, uh, one of which was on one of the last troop ships to uh, Korea. And I thought, uh, what an amazing amount of experience. And what I found was uh, they were the ones who were most even keeled. You know, they had a sense of humor about everything that was going on. You might have thought something was a crisis, but they had a a more wisened attitude approach because they had just seen a heck of a lot over four decades. And so we've got the same kind of perspective and depth of experience here. 42 years serving the country as a United States Marine, and it's just my honor and privilege to introduce the 38th Commandant of the Marine Corps, uh, General Berger. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Uh, I think we could do this one of two ways. We could either talk about change in large organizations and tumultuous times, or we could live stream uh, the ACMAX uh, confirmation <laughs> hearing, right. and you could provide color commentary. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we were talking off stage. The General Smith's confirmation hearing is going on now. Right. right. <clears throat> so I think we've got the better end of that deal. Uh, I don't know about that. Subject to the grilling, but uh, anyhow. Well, you know, we tried to pitch this as really dealing with substantial change when there is a sense of urgency to do that, right? People will kind of recognize, get an inkling that something needs to adapt or be modified to account for the reality of the world that's constantly evolving around us. And it just always seems to be hard, you know, it's a hard thing. And, uh, you know, clearly with you here on the stage, there's the backdrop of force design and things that you've been engaged with for the last four years. But it's the same issues that pertain to organizations like Heritage or a church congregation or a sports team or an individual's life. You know, you, yeah. you get in the habit of doing things a certain way over time, and then something has to either forces you or you see the opportunity or the need to change. And so I thought maybe you could just kind of address that in general, and then we'll get down into some of the uh, associated points on it. Um, great place to start. I'd say perhaps... Uh, first, uh, we should acknowledge there is a process in the military for the regular development tied to budget, sort of how do you adjust what you have. So we're never stagnant in, the, in any of the services, Marine Corps included. That process we call combat development in the military, but it's an annual thing tied to the budget. So that machinery already in place, been in place for a long time. But as you point, on, uh, as you point out, there are times in, in, in any organization, and I would say private sector the same, when you realize that the environment is changing at such a speed and a scale that e your normal processes are not, keep, are not gonna keep up. And if that's the case, then that means the competition's gonna start to move out in front of you. That's where we were. And uh, by, by we, I mean the Marine Corps in 2017, 18, 19 timeframe an acknowledgement that the world was changing pretty rapidly. Technology was moving, not linearly, but more like Moore's law curve. And that the Marine Corps had good annual processes, but not, it was, if we'd kept doing the same thing, we would, we would potentially fall behind. And then the third part of this, I would say, was a series of war games and exercises that the, the military did in that same time frame, where against a high-end adversary, the results were, were getting tough, tougher and tougher and tougher. So if you kept doing the same things, hmm. 
but they were moving faster than you were, you're gonna, you're gonna, it's not gonna get any better. So hence force design. Look out deep enough where you can get past the personnel and money churn of things. We chose 10 years. And then um, instead of take where, where your organization is now and what's the next step and the next step, our logic was back plan. If you can imagine what the world might look like in 10 years out, you know where you are right now, your organization. So map it backwards. Mm -hmm because the bureaucracy that is the Department of Defense and the Pentagon uh, will, will always resist change, uh, probably for good reason, so that you don't jerk right and left. So we back planned, back to today. Last part of that, I would say, in terms of change, organizational change, I got some fantastic coaching from um, a couple of members of Congress who I had gotten to know a little bit, so I went to them for advice. And they gave me just the best advice that I would not have in, you know, intuited otherwise. For example, um, one of them grabbed a legal pad out of his desk, drew a line down the middle of it and said, when you make a major change in an organization, you should you know, need two columns, winners and losers. And for those that are gonna lose, you got to figure out a way, if it's a congressional member, mm. that they can't go back empty-handed back to their constituents. That was a good lesson. And the second one was, he asked, uh, this other lady asked me, you have to figure out what are the main groups of people that have something to do with your organization. So I gave some thought to that, and this was four or five months before I took over. And on a whiteboard in uh, my office, I drew... I came up with four circles uh, that were bodies of people that I thought had a, might have a, something to do with the Marine Corps and change. One group was Congress. One group was my civilian leadership, the Secretary of the Navy, the Secretary of Defense, the President. One group was Marines, sailors that are serving right now, and one group was veteran Marines or anybody else who might have a say. So I, drew the, I figured those were the main four circles. And then I narrowed it down to which ones do I have to work hard on first to get immediate momentum. And that was Congress and my civilian leaders. So last part was a, a third great coaching point was figure out who in Congress, the members, the leaders, key leaders that have a stake in this, tell them what you're going to do, why you're going to do it, and then come back to them regularly individually and tell them where you are. So it really um, illustrates the importance of audience, right? Who Absolutely. the targeted audience is. Yeah. And, and that engagement methodology is completely different, right? I mean, there's a, an attention span, not being negative or positive, oh. but how much time do you have to sit down? Uh, is it a tweet or is it an hour brief? Is it mm -hmm. you know, social media use, what have you? And so gauging the message and how you do that engagement has to be dramatically different based on those communities Absolutely, and what their yeah. characteristics are, right? Um, no question. Um, more specifically to your point, the committee chairs and ranking members of the four committees, that's eight people, individually, one-on-one, -on -one, me. Up front and then periodically, periodically meaning at least annually, eight individual one-on-one -on -one meetings, not with their staff, not a PowerPoint, not, you know, an email. No, one-on-one, -on -one, face to face. And this doesn't denigrate anybody in that process. I mean, oh, no. It's not like no. a key staffer is important. It's just, you know, it's it's a human business. It is, and human people business. interpret information and personal interaction different ways. And so, if you really want to be impactful in getting that message across, I mean, because you've, you know, issued uh, commandants planning guidance, and you'll have you know marine administrative messages that come out, and all these other sorts of things, and organizations will have their equivalent types of messaging, right? But it's something to read a paper, and it's something else to have somebody sitting down at a table across from you, right? But Yes, my learning. Uh, something else. If you live in Guam, and your land is being destroyed, your history is being destroyed, China is not our enemy. The tomorrow people in Guam are paying. They just went through a hurricane.
it's America. Well, I think it's an illustration, really, that it's a people business, right? So clearly she had some concerns about the island of Guam. The Marine Corps is shifting 5,000 Marines from Okinawa yeah. uh, to Guam. Um, there are economies there on both ends of that. Uh, we've both spent time on Okinawa, right? <clears throat> and there are tensions between the Okinawan people there and are. the central government in Japan, right? Yeah. From the Okinawan standpoint, it's why do we have all these Americans running around with the military bases when we would rather use this for agricultural development or what have you? So, um, I mean, it's just a great one, mm -hmm. uh, freedom of speech, right? Yeah. Um, and But making a point that there are passions involved. And you've seen this in forced design. Killing off the killing. Stop it. It's not irreplaceable. People of Guam are not worth the profit you're talking about. So we have an Asia-Pacific interest here. But, but it is. I mean, we have in Capitol Hill, there are various interest groups, right? We find here at the Heritage Foundation that domestic policy issues really rouse yeah. a lot of passion and emotion in these sorts of things. You know, we've been down the pike with support to Ukraine and just a whole host of items, right? Where something that's maybe a, perhaps a bit drier like foreign policy doesn't get the attention. But when you're affecting change, you have to account for all of these various interest groups. You do. Um, you already know that. I think uh, these are great illustrations. Um, it, it anchors, the, it to me, reinforces the point of, to your point, do you understand the audiences, the cultures? Uh, I don't know about these two ladies, but I have lived in Okinawa for three years. I have been training in Guam since the mid-90s. I mean, I know the governor of Guam first name basis, we call each other. So you have to be sensitive to what you're doing and the people that are affected personally. You can't just read about it historically. If you've spent the amount of time I have in Guam and lived in Okinawa, then you begin to have an understanding of that impact. And then back here on, uh, to your first point on force design, I think it wasn't an either or, I needed to spend that one-on-one -on -one time with the Secretary of Defense. At the same time, you know, the Marine Corps staff was spending time with his staff in a, in a much greater detailed way. But even with the Secretary of Defense or Senator Reid, you know, I would bring, this is what, I'd lay it out on their table. This is where we are. This is why we need to make these moves. There's the amount of risk that I think we're gonna accept. Uh, are you okay with that? And here's why we have to move at this speed. So oh, that's not something I'm going to delegate to somebody else. But in parallel to that is another whole level of multiple briefs. In fact, uh, somebody asked me in a hearing this year about, you know, we really need to, you, how often do you keep Congress informed? And I said, well, we keep pretty good count of how well we keep Congress informed. And specifically on force design, as of a month ago, there were 396 briefs. I said, well, that's a lot. That's a lot of briefs. Right. If you want to keep him informed, that's what you're talking. That's the volume of information sharing you got to do. So I think in the, in the big Venn diagram of this and these overlapping things, um, I'll just use the word fear, right? Uh, where you're dealing with ambiguity or uncertainty. And, and in my mind, at least, it relates also to currency. So uh, just from my own personal experience, I've been with various organizations like you right. have, right? So yeah. back in the day, it was the Strategic Initiatives Group, right? right? Uh, Office of Net Assessment. And then when I retired from the Marine Corps, I was over at CSBA, yeah. a great group of folks. But the further you get away from your personal experience immersed in the day-to-day -day on you know, activities, right. you really don't know what's going on, right? So you hear a snippet of things, and you kind of interpret that through this lens that is now increasingly aging, right? And so if you if you start to get a sense that you really don't have control mm. or direct involvement, yeah. it, it naturally, I think, lends itself to resistance, to change. Right. Why are we having to work so fast? What is the sense of urgency, right? Uh, just because China might have a missile that flies at Mach whatever, why do we have to make all these uh, changes without no, without any consultation with any of the interest groups that you mentioned? I mean, I, th I think there's a lot of related interactions to those components. There are. Um, this is, I'm coming up at the end of my four-year term, which by law is, that's the limit. So next month I'll retire. Um, this morning, like every day, got up at uh, 410 
and spend from 4.30 to 5.30 reading classified and unclassified information, things that happen around the world overnight. And then you spend all day long, you know, doing whatever you're going to do, the commandant or the CNO, whatever they're going to do all day long. And then you get home at night and you repeat the same. You read the classified things. You get to go to war games. You get to travel to be part of exercises. You get to go to every bit of the industrial base that's manufacturing stuff to find out what's in the art of the possible. You sit in on discussions with the Secretary of Defense and the staff on everything from cyber to space to you name it. And all that for me stops on the 11th of July. <laughs> and then next commandant right. gets the benefit of that saturation you're talking about. So for me, I'll be out of date a week later. And I know that, I'm fine with that. I will know that the commandant sitting there is getting up at 415 <laughs> and uh, doing the same thing. And I will not, even if I have a security clearance, I won't be current. A week later, I won't be current. It's like leaving Afghanistan or Iraq after a year. Two weeks later, you're out of date. I think it's true what Keen said about ideas and change that it isn't necessarily, and I'm paraphrasing Dakota, but it's not necessarily the embracing of new ideas that's, that's hard. It's letting go of the old. So in your background, uh, Kosovo, K4, yeah. uh, policing and stability operations in Haiti, yeah. um, part of Desert Storm back in the day as a company commander, right, of a reconnaissance company, um, commanded the training team out of 29 Palms with combined arms and tanks and artillery and air power. Uh, uh, part of Afghanistan, what was going on there. Uh, I know you were dealing with Fallujah as <clears throat> RCT, Regimental Combat Team 8, right? And those sorts of things. And so you would get immersed in certain tools and ways of going about things. And then later on in life, you get to a point where those were really useful, but perhaps not as relevant right. to the environment that I'm working with now. Uh, we write a lot of papers here, <clears throat> and it's been a struggle for some of us, you know, that maybe somebody doesn't want to read a 50-page paper. <laughs> How in the world am I supposed to reduce that to a single page right. or three tweets or something? So it's that letting go of what's known, comfortable, familiar, has worked on the bet that this new shift to video or social media or a weapon system or whatever it might be, not yet proven in combat or getting a piece of legislation pushed through or whatever it might be, but that's an unknown, right? Yeah. So it's recognizing what's needed, but as you say, letting go. I think that's a great way of characterizing it. For me, um, those uh, deployments in combat that you highlighted, I think the value of them to me is a deeper understanding of the nature of war, the human part of war. It's not the tactics at that time, it's not the equipment, the weapon systems, because those will be replaced. But what that depth of combat deployments have helps you understand is the impact on the human. How do you train them? How do you retain them? How do you, what's the human part of war? I separate that from force design and the logical conclusions that we in, in the Marine Corps are drawing from where we are going. That's separate, and that assume, I assume there that any leader with the same information that I have is going to make pretty much the same decisions. It's not based on Kosovo. It's not based on Desert Storm. It's based on right now the relevant information we see and where the threats are going and where the world's going. That drives where we have to move and the speed. And do you think the folks coming through the training pipeline, whether it's young officers out of Quantico or enlisted folks from San Diego or Paris Island or wherever they're coming from, they're, they're pretty much plugged in, right? I mean, they want to serve, they want to support, as long as they've got good leadership and the right tools, uh, happy warriors, and they march off. I mean, is that? Uh, there are some who write, uh, I think this has been the case for, you know, long as there's been written word, that would say, you know, today's youth are not what they used to be. Here's what I'd tell you. One, I have a son on recruiting duty. So I have a lens into the high school population that's just incredibly valuable. And you, I get to travel around, of course, and see those Marines the way you're describing. I would tell you all a bunch of baloney. 
The Marines, uh, soldiers, sailors, airmen today, smarter than you and I were when we came in, learn in a different way, faster in some ways. Um, they have different experiences and different backgrounds, but my, the proof in the pudding for me is you watch them in a force on force, uh, as realistic as you can kind of training event, and your eyes water. You're like, they're making decisions, they're moving so quick, there's blows your mind. So I would debunk all that stuff about today's youth are not ready, not resilient, not whatever. Absolutely the opposite of what I see. But they're different. They ask why about a million times. Well, it's funny, your son's on recruiting duty. Yeah. My son's a brand new Marine right. in a year, uh, 1st Battalion, 8th Marines yeah. right now. And uh, the stories that he would bring back from Paris Island uh, you know, much longer period of instruction, right? Oh yeah, twice, it, almost twice. <clears throat> infantry training battalion, much longer. Yes. Uh, the types of equipment and gear, the time they spent in the field. Yeah. Uh, some hard people uh, out there uh, just licking their chops to actually get out into the world and do sorts of things. I think in a, in a lower tech force, you could have the kind of mm, population in your ranks that was brought it used and discarded every four years and i'm discarded not meaning in an impersonal way but you would have a very high turnover rate very very young uh, because there wasn't that re need for them to be either technologically uh, skilled or experience based but where we see the world headed you're going to need both of them so that's driving us more into the we have to retain more and uh, we will still recruit, of course. We'll still have a lot of young Marines. But if you're, you've been in the Marine Corps for four years and you're now a sergeant or a senior corporal, I need to keep you. We need to keep you now because you just, right now you have the experience and the skills, the leadership we need. Yeah, so fantastic. retain more, recruit probably a little bit less numbers. <clears throat> Well, I've talked uh, almost too long here. My wife can tell you that's always a danger. <laughs> <clears throat> so I'll ask one more question, sure. then we're going to turn to the audience and get some better questions from them. <clears throat> um, I call it kind of a, like a rhetoric reality gap, you know, or mm. this this uh, verbal acknowledgement that something has to change, but it's always the challenge in the implementation, right? So the Marine Corps has looked at the impact of long-range precision strike guided munitions for a while. Uh, we developed it, tried to develop the triple AV and its successor types of vehicles. The MV-22 Osprey was meant to close larger distances quicker, the LCAC. That, it goes all the way back to the 1990s. Yeah. So we've been kind of debating this for three decades. I think so. <clears throat> and it's really hard to make those changes. And I don't want to circle back and just say the same things, but, but bridging that that acknowledgement to actual implementation. Are there a couple or three kind of primary impediments or obstacles to that? And then after you shared that, we'll, we'll get to the audience. First, on the one side, I would say the drivers, what we didn't have in the 80s and 90s was a national defense strategy that drove you, that gave you the North Star where to go. And that's all that you know, that was huge in 2018 and in 2022, because both of them said, this is where we have to go. These are the priorities. Take risk in these areas in order to move fast. And Marines, and we did. Now, the impediments. Uh, first of all, you know, our own biases, of course, like you're saying, I have a safety blanket of the way that I do business, the way that I grew up in the Marine Corps, the way that I've trained. So you, Part of it is unharnessing ourselves from the way we learn, the way we train, the way we recruit. We have to recognize we have those biases. Some of that is healthy, but some of it you gotta, you gotta turn the corner on. Uh, some of it is the bureaucracy in the Pentagon. Some of it is our acquisition process. But I have, we have found ways to move even within the existing processes faster. And I think all the services are doing the same. They aren't necessarily shortcuts, but they are get this piece of equipment quickly, as early as possible into the operator's hands. Even if it's 50, 60%, uh, doesn't matter. Get it to them earlier and get the engineer who built, designed in touch with you, the operator, and step back. Because your conversation is gonna be a lot more valuable than going through the whole bureaucracy and back to the, back to the prime. So, 
speeding things up in terms of getting the right equipment was key. The last part, but the most important, I think, is the changes we have to make in the human part. Talent management, most important part of the Marine Corps. And big changes in our culture and society and expectations, et cetera, have to be accounted for. Yeah, have to, yeah. yeah. Back to the audience. Got to be, we know you've covered everything. So you sure. Say who you are and where you're from. Yeah. Being here today, my name is Tyler Seaman. I'm from Maryland. I'm working right now for Me Congressman too. Andy Harris. Oh, that's awesome. Where in Maryland? Uh, Phoenix, Maryland. It's uh, north of Towson. Yeah. yeah my wife went to Towson. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so uh, this should be an easy question, then, because we're yeah. both Marylanders. <laughs> so uh, next summer, I'm at the United States European Command in Germany. Yeah. I'm doing about uh, 12 weeks on the Joint Staff as a college intern. Awesome. Um, and my my question for you, sir, is uh, how can young people, college interns? best support a joint staff like that. Hmm. Boy, you're going to be, that, that time frame should be pretty fascinating time frame. When do you head there? Uh, May of next year. Next May. How? Uh, first, uh, what not to do. Don't allow yourself, try to prevent getting pushed off to the side with temporary help sort of approach. I don't think General Cavoli would ever do that. I know him really well. He would want you, he would want to pull you into this close to the inner circle as possible. But there are times just because of our size and whatever. So first, avoid getting stuck off into a corner uh, and then only, you know, periodically brought in. Get to the, I would say, get to the, the level, the, the circle, like in concentric circles wise, where they're making strategic decisions, having strategic conversations. Because part of when you go to a staff like that, my experience is part of it is the things. But more important, more important is your firsthand exposure to different leadership styles. You're going to be in a room of 20 people with 20 different leadership styles. Boy, it's like a graduate education. And how do they, how do they deal with people? How do they deal with change, like Dakota's saying? How do they make difficult decisions? How do they assess risk? I think the most important thing you're going to get away from to, you know, next summer is the people part. The exposure to different leadership styles that will probably in some way, you know, inform how you, how you develop your own. You won't mimic any of these. But for me growing up, I thought I, I, I thought I had gleaned specific things out of each of those experiences. But looking back, I think it was more about the people. Things I liked and things I did not like, frankly, because he and I others in here. Sometimes you serve under around leaders that you go you know, like, I ain't never treating people like that. That's important too. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> I have two questions. One is, over the next 10 years, by how many Marines do you see the force growing or being reduced? And secondly, what's the replacement for the aircraft carrier? Yeah. Uh, first one. Um, we're at our steady state right now. I would say if another major conflict came up like it did uh, in 2002 and 2003, where we expanded the Marine Corps from, frankly, where it is right now to, to 202,000, we'd be prepared to do that. But you don't, that we, maintaining 200,000 right now is not necessary. So we're at, our, we're at our good steady state fighting weight right now at about, 172, 173,000. That's about the right size, my view. And that, would, that was the size pre 9 11. So I think we can expand if we need to. What's the next aircraft carrier? Boy, that's a fantastic question. Replacement. Pardon me? Replacement for it. The replacement for it. Hmm. I think whatever it is, it's going to be a lot more unmanned. Um, than the current version, which is built around a man but can support MQ-25 or something like that. I think it's you're going to reach a steady state the other way, and maybe even some ways down the road where it's built for unmanned but could be could land a, a jet on there with a pilot. That's a ways down the road, but I think that's part of that migration. I don't know size. I don't know uh, what it does. My learning over time, to your point, is right now, and for the last 50 years, there's my view, there's three things that a global power needs to demonstrate 
and to protect. That's submarines, aircraft carriers, amphibious forces. Those three categories are what great naval powers have to have in order to protect your national interests. I don't, I don't know what the replacement for the aircraft carrier looks like. I don't know. It's a great question. You have a thought? No, what do you my, think? Well, my concern <clears throat> is that World War II, we put a lot of weight on the, on the, on the, the battleship. Yeah, battleships. And the battleship disappeared. And right. at some point, we've got B-52s that are going on 100 years. They're not going to be there forever. So no. we need to be thinking about what kind of replacements are we going to have for these aircraft. And I, th I agree with you. I think the unmanned solution is going to be it. More dispersed is probably going to be it. And we're going to be pushed to coming to those decisions very quickly because I don't see the Chinese backing down. No. I don't feel that there's a, a, a function of uh, proximity uh, sortie generation. That sortie could be an aircraft that's carrying weapons yeah. or my ability to salvo density yep. missiles. You know, whatever that thing is that places an effect on, on the target. And so if you're working from uh, Nebraska, <clears throat> how many times can you uh, fly an aircraft halfway around the world, <coughs> fire whatever the missile or bomb load is, yeah. come back, right? So the, the tempo of combat you need um, a density of firepower that's proximate, you know, that's in, in close range. So this stand-in forces concept, right? Absolutely. If you're not already there yeah. and you have to fight your way in or generate, then the war is going to be over and you're too late. If you don't have something like an aircraft carrier and your nearest fixed land base is 5,000 miles away, whatever that is, I don't know how you maintain tempo in, in the application of firepower, if that makes sense. Yeah. And that's the whole stand-in forces piece, it right? Is. That if you're working inside the enemy's threat envelope, at least you can cause him problems <laughs> instead of not being encumbered Absolutely. and being able to focus on the things that he wants to target. Yeah. Uh, young lady here. Right there, yeah. Name and who you're with, please. Hi, sir. Um, thanks for taking my question. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, because we've been talking about how much the world is changing, um, why you decided to join the military. And I was just, I don't know, wondering if that kind of reason would still be applicable today to yeah. today's young people. It was you know, a war I, bond drive in 1944, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a self-critical person. Uh, and if I had to do it all over again the last four years, I, I wouldn't change any of the decisions because they're all logically supportable. What I would change is how I described it. I spent two years talking about the things that I felt would need to change. What I should have balanced that with is the things that are not going to change, which is the reasons that I came into the Marine Corps. Uh, if I, in other words, the intangibles, the non-negotiables, the, the enduring parts of what it takes to become a Marine, you cannot, there's a lot of differences between the services. But one of the major differences is you can't, you can't join the Marines. You have to become a Marine. It is fundamentally different, and you will be that way for life. What brought me into the Marines? Initially, I was on a Navy scholarship at Tulane, and there was a Marine gunnery sergeant instructor in the ROTC unit who was, I'd, I'd never met a Marine before, never seen one, but instantly drawn to this person, this guy, his leadership, his way he carried himself, the way everybody respected him. Like, I don't know what that is, but I wanted that. And of course, you know, I went and talked to him about it. I'm on a Navy scholarship. Is it possible to switch? And he goes, I'm not sure you're good enough. And then he told me to go away, which I did. I went away. <laughs> and I thought, Oh, this is a test. I got it now. Th there is the intangibles are still the same thing that brings people to the Marine Corps right now. I told you my son is on recruiting duty. Marines recruit well. We make our mission because we send the very best people out on recruiting duty and we promote them and we have a brand. And the brand is I'm not sure you're good enough to be a Marine. The brand is joining uh, a group of elite warriors who the mission and the, and the fellow Marines are so important to you. That's why I came in. I came in first to get money for college, but when I saw the gunnery sergeant and over the next 
three years in college, it was clear like that, that service and personal example and phys- everything about it, well, that's what I wanted to do. It's the same thing today, same thing. We don't, recruiters don't talk about money. We don't talk about scholarship or college. We don't talk about any of that stuff. Talk about why do you think, why do you think you want to be, become a Marine? Because you know it's a life-changing thing. Same, same reasons. Now let's go online here. For... Sir, Cesar Cavado of Maritime and Port Services asks, what role is the Marine Corps playing in developing the strategic capabilities of the United States Space Command today particularly in the operational special forces arena where the Corps has recognized capability of relevance. Yeah, I think uh, there's a growing acknowledgement to your point that space-based capabilities aren't something for someone else to understand and think about. That he and I were captains a long time ago. Satellites were up there. And then eventually we knew they were connected to global positioning, GPS stuff, but that was about it. Now, now, tactical leaders have to understand space-based capabilities, have to. The basics are position, navigation, timing, but it goes way beyond that. Strategic capabilities, which you're talking about, and the connection to SOF, I would say absolutely yes. Not because we are wholly 100% dependent on it, but the web of um, intelligence and targeting and the web of logistics and sustainment, much of that is space-based, not all. You have to understand that, both in terms of a strength and a vulnerability. And if you're in a stand-in force or you're in soft, you're also, you need to understand it to what degree the adversary depends on it, and how do you negate that? How do you degrade that? So it, for him and me, it was, my GPS doesn't work. Now it's integral. It, that, that understanding has to be much deeper. Does the organization, you know, the Marine Corps is in investing some people, right? Some overhead. Absolutely. And having this Space Force component, right? Yes. Um, so that's also, I think, an example where you actually have to be physically present. You do. And you can't just be Physical a customer. Physical location here matters. Yeah. Hard to describe in an unclassified environment, but your geographic location matters, I would just say. And, and the component in physical contact with Absolutely. Mother Space Force. Absolutely, yes. All that stuff. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> sir, you're in the center. Sir, good morning. Jeff Spites with Raytheon Technology. Hey, Jeff. And a veteran Marine. Uh, first of all, thank you, sir, for your service to the country, your leadership, your vision, it, particularly during this time of transformation uh, the last four years and maybe a couple years before that. Thank you especially for the dignity, the grace, the, humil- the humility that you exhibited during a lot of times of uh, tension and uh, friction that were played out way too publicly. So thank you very much for that. For the crowd that's probably not aware of it, would you uh, recount a little bit uh, two uh, previous tours of yours, one at MOTS 1 that I know uh, affected you personally, Yeah. and the other when you were the commander of Marine Corps forces in the Pacific, Mm -hmm. where your peer commanders out there and your exposure to more major league wargaming led to your uh, pillar foundational yeah. thoughts in force design. Thank you, sir. Um, and I'll try to move through this pretty quickly. First, the MOTS-1 part. Um, M-A-W-T-S-1 is our school in uh, Yuma, Arizona that uh, is advanced, it began as just advanced aviation, but has become an advanced whole Marine Air Ground Task Force high-end training. It trains a weapons and tactics instructor who is the premier tactician in the squadron or the battalion. I went there after Desert Storm, left 2nd Reconnaissance Battalion, went there to be an instructor. Had no idea why, I couldn't even understand why they would have infantry guys at, at an aviation school. What am I supposed to, this is crazy. Turned out to be an incredible three years for me. 
because there you are doing combined arms at the highest and most realistic all live fire, integrating infantry, ground units, airborne, everything. So for me, those three years were an acceleration of what Marine Air Ground Task Force combined arms, single battle, because if, you if, you, if you're gonna teach it, you better master it. And if you all can just imagine uh, being in that kind of a school where only experienced hand-picked people are gonna get sent for this high-end training, uh, and you get three years there, and everybody that's an instructor is hand-picked. So nobody drove us to be better every day. It's the pure competition that made your, drove me to another level. MAR-4 PAC, Marine Forces Pacific, absolutely formative at the right time for me. I was a three-star general. My counterparts in the Army and the Navy and the Air Force are all four-star uh, four star admirals and generals. My boss at that time, uh, Admiral Harry Harris first, uh, as the commander of, at that time, Pacific Command, PACOM. Formative for me because a series of war games where Admiral Swift and I and others and, 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 the, and, the, and the commander in chief uh, all would go to these war games. And for me, watching in a high end fight how our forces might do in the prelude up to in the conflict was not very good. Not good. And then you could forecast if the adversary is moving at this pace, how it's going to be next year and the year after. So convince me 100%, we have to move now. We have, to, we have to accept risk in certain areas and move very quickly if we're going to stay in front. Absolutely formative. The last part of it was, though, reminded me, not reminded me, it taught me again, the value of, part of the value of the Marine Corps is as a naval expeditionary force. We can fight ashore. But what we do for the nation is really powerful when we're teamed with the Navy as a naval expeditionary force. Hence part of the planning guidance a year to a couple, couple years later, two years later, we need to go back to our naval roots and, and be naval. Not because it's our roots, but because that's, that's what our strategy, that's how, that's how we're most effective. Well, that's where people are formed, right? So if Absolutely. the Marine Corps has been involved in sustained operations ashore for 20 years, and really good at it, really right? Good. I mean, yeah. really, really successful. How do you step away from that, right? Without saying that you know that there are problems incumbent. But as a naval power projection force, it's really a distinguishing characteristic of the Marine Corps yes. compared to the Army or anybody else. Right? Yeah, the Army and the Marine Corps are complementary, but you don't need two armies and you don't need two Marine Corps. No, we are lighter, more expeditionary, more naval. We had another one, and we'll come back. Yes, sir. Brian Coppersmith asks, what advice do you have for innovative leaders whose plans are strongly resisted by stakeholders of the enterprise, particularly when challenged by former senior leaders of an yeah. organization? Uh, I don't, you know, I don't know the, if it's relevant to all organizations, but the steps I took in terms of which of the bodies of who's the constituent bodies, that was very helpful to me because I could separate Congress from the Secretary of Defense and Secretary of the Navy, from I could that help me figure out how to communicate his point to the different audiences in what forms and how often. So first, figuring out those and separating them and figuring out a strategy for each. Second, I think be as logical as you can and as transparent as you can. Um, you're going to make if you're going to make big change, then some of that isn't going to involve some big assumptions about the future. Okay, what are they? And constantly test them. But be clear about what they are up front. Don't try to hide them. Third part, I would say, what's been very helpful to us is the process of how we learn and adjust as we go. We decided early on, in, in, in the early days of my Marine Corps, we had an experimental unit. It was in Quantico, and it was that was the test bed for where new ideas and equipment were, were kind of test road, see how it goes. We, did, we knew we would have to move fast. So we decided to go with plan B. And plan B is use the Marine Corps as your experimental unit and the world as your laboratory. But you, in order for that to work, you have to build in the closed loop back for where his unit is in Japan 
experimenting with some concept or some piece of gear. It has to feed back into the Marine Corps quickly so that we can make adjustments on what's working and what's not. This whole campaign of learning has to be a, a tight loop. So what do you do for any organization? If you're gonna project out where things might be in the, into the future, some things you're gonna get wrong. Do you have the mechanism to learn and adjust along the way? And are you willing to test those initial assumptions, go, we had it wrong, we need to make an adjustment? We've done that with the size of the infantry battalion, Absolutely, some of the yeah. squadrons involved, those yeah. sorts of things. Yeah, and I don't see those as faults or negative. I think that's, that's actually learning at speed. Because if we had started with, I think it needs to be X, and four years later, you ain't willing to move off of that, that okay, that's, that's how you're gonna go down the wrong path. Sir. Morning, sir. Mike. I'll go in here. Morning, sir. George Nicholson, the Global Special Operations Forces Foundation. I want to thank you everything you, you and the previous commandants have done for SOF. Going back to Chuck Pittman, <laughs> who I was with on the Iranian hostage yeah. mission, and Ed Seifert. Yep. One of the things, and again, SOF would not have the V-22 today if it had not been for the Marine Corps. You all were on the cutting, cutting, cutting edge. Uh, one of the events I was with you, you know, a few weeks ago, you talked about one of your biggest concerns is logistics. I know that Mark Esper has said that the future war is going to start in space. It's going to start in, uh, in the cyber domain. But the biggest concern is our assumption that we're going to have unrestricted strategic uh, logistics, C5s, C17s, and that's not out there. What do you see of those challenges, and how's that going to be fixed? Our uh, traditional way of carving out functions of warfare are things like intelligence and um, command and control. For me, I'm exactly, and I had this conversation with Secretary Esper early on. For me, the area of war fighting we have to concentrate on the most right now is logistics, is logistics. Not because we're lazy, not because we're technologically behind on per none of that. It's because, for the reason you just stated, up until a few years ago, all of our logistics was protected. It was safe. It was We wouldn't need to dedicate any real effort to that. But now, from cyber to physical kinetic attack, all of that is threatened. So we have to now approach every bit of sustainment, every category of logistics as contested. Okay, that's a whole nother place right now. Oh, and I'm talking about not just the frontline units that are, you know, closest to the, where the threat might be. I'm talking about the industrial base all the way back in Idaho that builds a bearing that, whatever the bearing is, that, you know, is the magical component to the piece of gear. That whole line, that whole supply chain can be interdicted. We need to think about that. We need to plan for that. So the mobility part of logistics, how are we gonna move forces around? How are we gonna do that in a contested environment? How are we gonna interfere with their logistics? I think this is the area for me that is the most important. And there's a lot of talk about JADC2 and hypersonic weapons, all of which is goodness. None of that will matter if we don't get the logistics right. None of it will. One extra part of this, the most, it, that's hard enough in the first 72 hours. You get into a protracted conflict, it goes up exponentially, the challenges. And we should not assume that a conflict's gonna be over in 96 hours, 72 hours, heck no. The last 15 months should be pretty good evidence of that. Is it fair to say that the technologies provide uh, not only the challenges, you know, cyber attack, right? Yeah. Uh, but they also provide opportunities. In other words, they you do. can do things today with unmanned craft or whatever that were almost inconceivable yes. 15, 20 years ago. Absolutely. Um, from moving supplies and troops around to um, Caterpillar. I learned from Caterpillar about four or five years ago. They have what we need which is like up here, this map of the world. And in the world is every Caterpillar machine in South America, Africa, everywhere else. Anyway, he can see 
on there where an alternator is going to go bad on a bulldozer in some country in, Cal in South America in the next 80 hours of operation. Predictive logistics. Okay, this is where we got to go. Because right now, we're going to either wait till the alternator fails on the gear, or we're going to change it out preemptively with the wrong time. We need the, the logistics part is huge. And artificial intelligence, machine learning are a big, big part of it, as well as autonomous unmanned systems. Right, right now, even just predictive, predictive logistics is huge. We've got time for one or two more questions yet online, and then we've got two right back here. Yeah. Oh, we had one way over here as well. So we're going to try to get through these real quickly. So online. Sir, is there anything you would like to have done differently as Commandant? I mentioned one. I would change the way that I describe how the Marine Corps needs to evolve. I would have emphasized more, and these things will not change. So absolutely, I would, you know, if I could rewind, I would go back and balance my comments with, we need to change, here's why, these things will not change. But as far as other than that, no, I have no regrets, I, I, none at all. I think I got great advice on how to move quickly. I've tried to follow that advice. Uh, and the critics, the, the, the naysayers, I listen to them. I don't take any of that personally. Some of that has influenced decisions we've made, but I don't, I, here's where I am today. I think given the same amount of information that I have, we have, other leaders would do the same. So I wouldn't, I don't have any regrets, wouldn't change any major things at all, no, there's none. Go here real quick. Two questions. One, I want to follow up on the newly launched Marine Innovation Unit. And number yeah. two, I want to go back to congested, uh, uh, excuse me, contested uh, logistics. So first on the Defense Innovation Unit, one of the comments the uh, leader made, which was uh, rather uh, unique, was the most dangerous weapon in the Marine Corps is the Marine's mind. So I really enjoyed that. But what were you, what are your expectations to come out of that unit as they develop and try and find new things. On congested logistics and bringing together, I should say, congested logistics and a um, inspector general report on the predictive analytics, not only for logistics, but for all the yeah. data yeah. that the uh, that DOD's brought together. What do you see? What are those opportunities that you would see bringing those together? And then the final item is just for everyone here, um, if you're interested more in congested logistics, say uh, there's an NDIA article that focuses on marine mobility that just came out last month. So go on NDIA.org. Thank you. I will probably not remember or get to all three parts, but first part, I, only, I don't normally argue with a person asking a question, but I would say the most dangerous weapons perhaps Perhaps is a Marine's mind. That's, I, could, I could agree with that. I thought you were going to say a Marine's mom, and I would definitely <laughs> agree with that part. Uh, that wasn't my comment. That was I know. Uh, but my wife is a Marine mom. She would absolutely agree with that. Um, I think it was General Whistler's wife said that uh, she could always get another husband. She can't get another son. I'm not touching that with a 10 <laughs> If you've been married for 40 couple of years, you don't touch, you don't touch comments like that, you just let them go. Um, contested logistics, your, your question was about the confluence of convergence of that and what else? Really? And at MIU? Design, yeah. The future of marine yeah. Force yeah. We established a marine innovation unit that, of reservists um, in New York and their role is not to fix today's problems at all. They, being reservists, they aren't Marines in uniform, active duty every day. They have jobs. And we pulled them in because of their connections to where they're from. And we have more, more volunteers than we, can, than we can bring on. That is our connection to innovation and what's in the art of the possible five, six, seven years down the road. But also how, how can we speed up our own processes to get things faster into the hands of Marines or a concept quicker through the, through the whole process. They are, that's our nurture, that's our kind of, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, but the MIU, the Marine Innovation Unit is our connecting file, our linkage to 
innovation across U.S. and, and other nations. I think it's gonna pay off. And areas like predictive analysis in wargaming, in logistics, uh, you name it, I, I think this is an area ripe for unpacking, like you, as you point out, I agree. We have just a minute or two. Sure. Um, here, right. My name is Connor. Uh, you mentioned earlier how we are needing to sustain um, the Marines that we have, and I just wanted to hear about kind of your strategy for that, about how we maintain those Marines and so. Yeah. Um, the Marine Corps that I grew up in um, took care of me for my whole career. Had made me a, a had a great career path. I think we be we have to though make an adjustment into more focused on the individual from the time they're in high school all the way as long as we can keep them. By individual, I mean what are they good at? What do they want to do? How do I match that with where the Marine Corps is right now? They have information available to them that I didn't have. I'll just use a very simple example. When I was uh, all up until five years ago, four years ago, Every assignment, every end of my tour, I talk to my assignment person and he says, these are the things, you, these are the next assignment, these are your choices, these are the two or three. And they were always the two or three that he needed to fill or she needed to fill. We need to get to the place where every Marine can see all openings all across the globe and they can communicate to those, those units about what is this job like, what does this position do? We need to just unleash the communications that we have now that we didn't have then. So that the uh, assignment person, they're only probably stepping in 20% of the time if it's not a good fit. Otherwise, go. We, and we need, to pull, we need to manage their careers in a much different way with them having a much bigger say, I would say. They need to feel valued. They need to feel like they're making a contribution. We also need to make it possible for him to go from active duty to reserve to a civilian job back again. We need to make that much more permeable than it is today. That's how we're gonna keep him. I think we are up against the clock. I know you've got a tight schedule today and all that. So I'd ask her just any kind of wrap up comments you might have about uh, maybe something that wasn't addressed or thinking about any organization, individual, surveying the world around you and how do you, how do you grapple with it? How do you deal with it? Um, one, I found uh, a huge, a great amount of value to me, sessions like this. You may not think so, but whether it's a, a forum like this or a media round table or a classroom at Stanford, to me, the questions that come at you formulate how I think. They, they aren't tests, They're, but the, the shape of those questions and the trends in those questions, hugely helpful. So um, first, I'd ask you to keep this up as a part of public debate and discourse because it's incredibly valuable. Um, we should not shy from that. We should try, we should look for those opportunities to engage. I think second, we need we have an all volunteer force, but it's not really all volunteer, is it? It's all recruited. All volunteer would mean you just wait and they come into your office and that's all you need to do. We have an all recruited force. Why do I mention that? I think, how many, can I just show a hand? How many people in here have any military experience? Okay, thank you. You are also recruiters. Most of your communities probably don't know anything about your military service, or not much, if they know at all. But we can't assume that America understands their military if they don't understand a human being, meaning you. So I'm asking, the more and more I'm around, I'm like, actually, we can reconnect America with its military and the government with its military through you all. But you're, it's not going to be your nature to go bragging around town about what I did in the Navy or the Army or, or State Department. But I'm asking you to do just that. Because I think most communities know you, but they have no idea what, that you served in government in any way. I need you to talk. 
need you to recon help reconnect the people with their government. And I think it's in church and school and whatever. It's all the sports events. It's all those places in the community. I'm, I'm not panicking, but I think we can, we can bring this back together. If, but it, you're going to have to be more proactive. Everybody who raised their hand, you're going to have to be more proactive about it. Uh, General Spore, I'm not asking you to jump in, <laughs> but you've kind of lived this. At, at the end of the Cold War, the Army was nearly 800,000 active duty soldiers, 770,000, and the national population was like 210 million or something. Right. Right now we're at 300 plus, 330 million, and the Army is down to 452 or something. Right. So these two diverging Absolutely. lines, there are fewer contact points. Yes. Yes. between the American public and anybody who has served. So it, it's a challenge. It is a challenge. I, don't, I, don't, I do not assume that America doesn't trust their military, despite what some polls might say. I think they just don't know it. Yeah. I don't think they know anybody firsthand. But yet everybody, must have been 20 people in here, raise their hand. They can know the military, but we got to go out and we got to share how we got into the military, what, what, what serving in the military did for me. We got to do that, yeah. I think. We're a minute past stop time. Thank you. I uh, really appreciate you being here, taking time, and uh, Godspeed and best wishes on the days ahead. And